Sandy Williams, uh, and I have the privilege of being Gladstone president. Uh, uh, I'm pleased to look out and see uh, many familiar faces, uh, Gladstone loyalists uh, of the highest order, and, but it's also fun to see some new faces. Um, there's two words I'd like you to think about tonight, uh, and you'll see how this weaves through uh, the uh, exercise that we planned for you. Um, the first of those words uh, is discovery. Um, because discovery is the core mission of Gladstone. Uh, the second of those words, though, is a word um, I used to be a little embarrassed to use, uh, and that word is cure. Um, I used to be embarrassed to say we're searching for cures because uh, that's a kind of grandiose concept. Uh, cures don't come about very often, cures for dread diseases. But it is at the root of what we try to do. And what we're going to illustrate for you tonight is the intersection between the discovery of which Gladstone has developed a premier uh, operation to do that, discovery about how biology works, and our ultimate goal, uh, the goal that motivates all of us, and I think the goal that brings many of you into the Gladstone circle is the notion that grievous diseases like Alzheimer's, heart failure, deadly viruses that are currently unsolved can be solved and will be solved through science. So let me, I have an illustration to show you if I can get that to work. Here we go. So, um, so again, here's this word discovery and this is Gladstone's core competency. I'm going to use some business language. I know many of you are, are, are leaders in business and industry, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll use your language a bit tonight. Our core competency is discovery of secrets of nature that increase our understanding of biology. And over the years, we've created a very effective system to do that. Uh, this is what's sometimes known as basic science or fundamental science. Its purpose is to understand how things work in our bodies, in our cells, and what goes wrong with diseases. And the premise is, without that kind of understanding, we'll never find the cures to, um, to serious diseases. Now, what is, if this is our core competency, what is our product? Our product our knowledge, what I'm calling here knowledge assets, each one of these arrows is meant to represent the discovery, a discovery that is uh, accomplished by a scientist uh, here at Gladstone or elsewhere uh, as they go about their attempt to understand biology and disease better. So as we go along, we produce these assets. This is what we do, and these are very valuable. Uh, they most of these we give away. We put them in the public domain by publishing the, the, the knowledge that we have. A few of these are subject to, to patent controls. We'll still ultimately publish them. But this is what we do. Now, we do this in, an, in the nonprofit world. You know we're a charitable organization. So we do this without any expectation of financial gain, but it does cost money. And it costs a lot of money. This is a capital-intensive, labor-intensive kind of operation that we're in. And every one of these knowledge assets costs some millions of dollars to, to produce. Uh, that's, so this is the nature of the discovery engine that we've created here. Um, and you know, we could stop there. We could stop there and say, uh, this is important. We're doing fine work. Some of you would appreciate us for what we do in this realm. Uh, and that is where uh, some of our sister organizations do stop. These knowledge assets will be woven together out there in the community, perhaps to find cures, uh, but this is a sufficient uh, uh, raison d'etre for organizations like ours to exist. However, I think we've come to a collective agreement among our scientists uh, at Gladstone, and I think this is what has drawn many of you to wish to know about us and support us, uh, that there's another dimension, that we really want to be more directive about finding the cures that society needs, that we need as individuals for our families, uh, for our friends, and that introduces a different kind of process. Um, I used to think that 
the process of discovery and the process of finding cures was collinear, meaning the same sorts of things do both. I've come more recently to the conclusion uh, that that's not actually how it works. You have to have these things. These are the raw materials for a cure. But to turn them in the cure, you need a different skill set and you need different kind of organizations to come into play. We can't do this by ourselves. And here's where the for-profit world comes in. And some of you live and excel in that world. Um, once you leave the nonprofit sector, this knowledge needs to be woven into fabrics to create cures, largely by biotech or pharma companies. Uh, medical device companies could be in there too, but I've simplified things. Some of the large biotech companies take on uh, properties of what I've called pharmaceutical companies here. But several things happen. To go from knowledge assets to a cure, you need skill sets that are more better developed in these organizations than they are in ours, and you also need money at logarithmically increasing levels. Uh, a knowledge asset that will become a cure will necessarily pass through from the millions of dollars per asset stage to the tens of millions and the hundreds of millions before it is approved by the FDA and becomes a cure. And this is the system that we live in. Now, um, what we'd like to do more effectively than, than has been true in the past is this, is figure out a way to take our knowledge assets and drive them up this chain to where they cross this threshold where the for-profit world and the investors who live there say, this looks like it's going to work. We're ready to put money into it now. Uh, and unfortunately, the current state of affairs is that most of these knowledge assets reside somewhere down here. And, and only very few of them come close to, the, uh, to this line. And to make sure I haven't lost anybody, we're defining here a knowledge asset as a discovery that has the potential to be a cure. It's a long way from a cure, but it's an insight into how biology works or what might go wrong that looks like if we could just know enough and drive enough, it could produce this kind of outcome that we want. So this is what we want to have happen more often now. Uh, we need help to do that, and uh, it's crossing this threshold that really becomes uh, our contribution to what can be a cure. So tonight, we've got three of Gladstone's most eminent and successful scientists, and they're going to talk to us about how do we do this. Uh, and if I leave you with one message overall, what I want you to understand is that two things are essential if we're going to find cures to Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, Pick's disease, these unsolved things that, that, that plague us now. Ebola looms out there. Uh, all of these things that are threats to society and our lives, how are we going to cure them? You must do this, and we should never abandon our zeal and our uh, determination to continue to produce more and more of these knowledge assets. But we also want to be creative and think about what are new ways in which we can act so that this gap gets filled and more of these assets work their way up where they really have um, the chance to become a cure. Uh, so that's my latest intellectual analysis of uh, how things work uh, in our, our biomedical world. Uh, and now we're going to hear from some of the stars who are going to tell us what fills that gap. Uh, so our first uh, person will be Warner Green.